All right, it is my great pleasure to introduce Lynette Mullen, our speaker. Um, she is an independent project manager, a writer, a historian. Um, one of her discoveries sparked an interest, and I think that's what she's presenting on today. She's in the process of writing a book about this same thing, and we're gonna hear all about it. So welcome, Lynette. <laughs> Uh, it's a map, right? Can I just use that? And I think oh, sure. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Then I just think it. Yeah. Either awesome. way. Okay. Is this short? Yep. Oh, crap. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hello, hello, hello. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I can't believe you guys get up this early. Hello. <laughs> but you see beautiful sunrises. So I'm like, yeah, okay, maybe this is part of why they keep doing it. I could totally see that. It was absolutely gorgeous this morning. Um, well, like Vanessa said, um, I am a project manager, writer, and historian. I used to do most of project management, mostly in economic and workforce development, and I think our, my paths have crossed with a couple of folks. I worked on the Wear a Mask campaign, AJ, I don't know if you remember that. Done a bunch of things in the community over the years, but um, history was a hobby and interest, and now it's a passion. Um, and like Vanessa alluded to, there was something that happened um, during COVID, actually, that really ignited my interest in the red light district and i'll tell you about that real quick before i dive into the rest of my presentation if i can figure out okay so during COVID, i live about a mile from old town and so you know i, I work at home right so lonely bored looking for things to do so i'd walk to old town i have a history blog and i would look at old buildings which i love i'd pick an old building i'd go home learn a little bit about it and then look it up in the newspaper and then write something on my blog and there were enough people going to the blog that i knew i wasn't the only person on the planet interested so i kept doing it and one day i was down there in old town though and i'm on the boardwalk and i'm looking at that big parking lot between jack's and where um dick taylor's is going in which is going to be really exciting but there's a big parking lot there and I thought, well, something must have been here, you know, in this big parking lot. And so I went home and there's these great maps, Sanborn Fire Insurance maps. And I'll show you uh, one of those in a bit. But I looked it up and found a reference to the Scandia Hotel. So the Scandia Hotel was in that parking lot. And this is a picture of Scandia. And so I looked it up in the newspaper archives and I ran across this story. In the early 1900s, a woman named Virginia Jeffrey or Jeffrey, depending on the article, same woman, uh, was abandoned by her husband. So she was raising their six or seven children on her own. She was working as a maid in the Scandia Hotel. And the article was in the paper because as she was working as a maid, the two owners tried to force her into a life of shame. Mm -hmm. She resisted and they beat her up. And so that's what this story was about. And I honestly don't know, she ended up suing the owners. I don't know what happened in that particular case, but I had grown up in Eureka and there was, I, or it, Humble, and I'd always heard about the red light districts, right? You know, it's crazy district. I mean, from the time I was a kid, but I'd never really researched it, but this sparked my interest. And I found a million stories, many of which I won't have time for today, but it really became clear the life of shame that we had a number of women. We had a very active district. I started looking at photographs differently. So I had had that picture of the Western Hotel for a very long time. It was on First Street there. And if you look at my blog, it'll make you sad how many wonderful, beautiful buildings have disappeared, but that's another story. Um, but as I looked more carefully, I noticed these two ladies sitting in the window and I'd never really noticed them. And I will guarantee you that proper young women would not have posed in the window like they did. So I guarantee you that these were working ladies. That's, there we go. So when we think about the red light districts, so we think about um, life of shame or just, you know, brothels, bordellos. Um, I, when you think about them historically, some people have more this sort of, you know, kind of sensuous, sexy, exciting places that, that men were able to retreat and go to. Um, but of course the world wasn't really like that, especially for the ladies. Maybe they were creating that illusion for their customers because after all these were customers, right? And so in order to get them to keep coming back, you absolutely had to create this environment, uh, this place where they would want to, that where they'd feel good, felt like they had good service and they would keep coming back. For the ladies, not so much that. I won't dive too deeply into that today. 
I'm having a, a, we're going to do that. Okay. So the volcano theory of sexuality. So, and I don't have my little, for some reason, my little notes aren't showing up on this. So I may miss some, I may not be quite as fluent in this whole presentation as I want to be. So, uh, yeah. Oh, no, no, no. I meant my little oh, your, notes, oh. but that's all right. Um, so the volcano theory of sexuality. So there was a book written in the 1850s, 1860s um, about the, the gold mines and everybody coming out. And basically the volcano theory of sexuality in this book, the author wrote that unless men had some sort of sexual outlet, that they would erupt in orgies of adultery, rape, physical violence, and even, God forbid, homosexual embraces. And so really what followed from that is prostitution was a necessary institution because we had these pure women that we wanted to keep clean and safe, but yet men had to be taken care of. And so that was where prostitution came from. When we look at Humboldt County, so Humboldt County was actually part of Trinity County in 1852. The census, 1,741 males. <laughs> Gives you some idea, right? Yes. So Given this, and given that a lot of men believe this volcano theory, um, quite frankly, in the early years, Native women were not safe in this camp. They weren't safe anywhere. But um, again, a presentation for another day. But that gives you some idea of kind of what the dynamics were. Right. And so... Eureka, when I'm talking about Eureka's lower district, Eureka actually had a district. And I'll talk a little bit about how it was restricted at one point. This was Eureka's lower fourth. So if you guys, it looks most of you, maybe not everybody, but almost everybody has been here a while. Um, the lower fourth was actually around the co-op. So fourth and B to fourth and C down near the waterfront. These houses there in the lower right, those were brothels. So when we think of brothels, we think maybe of something fancy, Humboldt, near Eureka, not so much. Arcata had a nice one, and I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Um, but to really, most of them were kind of modest homes. You had a madam and you had some inmates or girls that worked there. And this is the, the Sanborn, this is an example of a Sanborn map that I was talking about. These are amazing. So if anybody's interested in local history of buildings, let me know. I've got some cards and I'll just send you a link because they're addictive. But you will notice in the early ones that uh, certain buildings were referred to as female boarding. Many of those were brothels, probably most of those were brothels. So this is another example that gives you another idea of where the district is. So next time you're driving down 4th Street and you see the veterans, the beautiful three, four, three, four, that whole row was brothels. So you can see uh, some of them, the three there in that photo are still there. So that two-story house and then the others are right where that building is now. So that was the lower district in Eureka. There were some scattered uh, in Old Town and that happened after the district closed. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but so there were scattered brothels in Old Town, but mainly the girls worked in the district. So early houses. So I wanted to go back and get an idea um, of what we had here. And one of the earliest mentions is 1855. There was a shooting, actually. And um, one of the, the, the man that shot, uh, it was Rohner, Henry Rohner out of Fortuna, um, ran brothels. And the newspaper reported on this. But at that point, this is what the newspaper said. It was humiliating to even state that these houses existed, right, in Humboldt County. Didn't even want to own it. You will see that that attitude kind of progressed over the years. Um, in 56, in Isabella Kingsley was charged with running a brothel, but men stepped up and said, oh, no, that's not what she's doing in her house. And so she was acquitted. Whether those men were customers or not, I don't know, but, um, but it got her acquitted. By the 1870s, there were vagrancy laws. So vagrancy laws really targeted the customers and men living off the women. It wasn't necessarily criminalizing the women at that point. That would change, but that's how it was. There was also a lot of talk about the dangers of body houses. So not only were our young men and women at risk, um, there was disease, there was violence, there were drugs. There was a lot of things that happened in these homes um, that proper folks uh, were really concerned about and didn't want their children exposed to. 
Um, one of the things I won't dive into this much today, um, but it absolutely needs to be mentioned is uh, I would say 95% of the Chinese women that were in this state um, at before and up to the turn of the century were brought here intentionally um, for sex work. They were brought against their will, didn't realize what they were doing, and that's where they ended up. I don't have a lot of evidence of that happening in Humboldt County, um, but it certainly did. Uh, there were smuggled, these women were smuggled in, they were literally auctioned off. Um, and this is in California, free state, right? Not for these women, it wasn't. We did have China Mary here. So I did a story not long ago. I don't know if folks read it in the North Coast Journal, but it was focused on opium. And in Eureka by 1880, we had a woman named China Mary who was running an opium den. Um, unfortunately, I also found reference to her in the census where she was in the county hospital suffering from syphilis. So my guess, even China Mary, who was here in Eureka, had been brought here and, and at least for a while was forced to work as a prostitute. Of course, the expulsion happened uh, in Humboldt County in 1885, and all the good people of Humboldt said, well, now our, all our vice is gone. We're good now. We're clean. Of course, that absolutely wasn't true, but that was the way folks looked at it. And so now back to the towns and how they dealt with this particular industry. So Ferndale, Ferndale had a house on the hill or a cottage on the hill. It was there since at least 1890, probably earlier than that. If you're familiar with Ferndale and you're driving through town, you go through town, Ocean, where the steeple is. You got the cemetery there. If you kept going between the two cemeteries, there's a house on the hill. It was actually used um, in Salem's Lot for folks that have been here a really long time. That was the brothel in Ferndale. In 1892, a woman named Edna Gardner tried to build another brothel. And I wish I had a little pointer here. So this, if you guys are familiar with the steeple, the music venue of the Methodist Church, that is that. And Edna tried to build her house right around here. The night construction, start, so construction started on a Monday that night. The wives and daughters of Ferndale's prominent citizens came with a horse and a rope and pulled it off the foundation. She ran into other challenges, but she did eventually finish the house. She received guests for a while, but in May, somebody burnt it to the grounds, along with the town hall next door. So Edna gave up, she came back to Eureka. Ferndale said, we've got that house on the hill, that is enough. And basically I think the, the wives and daughters didn't want a resort where people could see their husbands and brothers and sons going in and out. So, and the house on the hill was there into the 1915, 1920, so it, it, was, it was there. And then there's Arcata. So in the early 1900s, two women tried to open a resort in Arcata. I believe it was across the freeway. William Lindsay, who had participated in the Indian Wars and had no problem killing Indians and even collecting their skulls as souvenirs. He died one day doing that. Um, was so incensed that these women could be doing this, that he lodged a complaint with the city. And it was the leaving of the curtains open where the rooms are lighted, the inmates of the house making their toilet, which is basically just washing and that sort of thing. Um, scantily dressed, if dressed at all. So he could kill people, but naked ladies were too much. <laughs> so that was William. This house was shut down. And then there's this one. And this one's right over there. I'm sure most of you will recognize this house. This is Minnie Lewis rented this place um, right among the respectable residents of town. So of course, everybody was incensed. Part of it was these houses were loud, right? People got drunk, but there was just the moral issue too. And so they ended up with a state injunction to shut her down. She had a house in Eureka, she went back to Eureka. And so I will go to Eureka. So in 1885, there was a morality ordinance, right? You know, body houses were bad, prostitution was bad, gambling was bad, even swear words, bad, 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 right? But by 1896, Eureka had gotten to the point where they were like, okay, cops, just don't go into a house while you're working. Just stay out of them while you're, you're on duty. Just do that. And so, um, so that was that. In 1900, the women, so the women, they ran their houses, but a lot of, um, an easy way to make money, and really the way they made most of their money was off of liquors, liquor sales. They charged a dollar for a bottle of beer or a small glass of whiskey. And so they started being raided uh, for selling intoxicating liquor without a license. Um, and this was a big revenue generator for the city. It was like thirty dollars, I think, in nineteen hundred. Um, and they raided all these different ladies. Um, in nineteen oh one, a council member proposed taxing them 
right? Like any other business, nobody wanted to do that. Um, so that didn't happen. But, and this was public conversation in the papers. By 1903, the city of Eureka is going, okay, we've got, and there were 30, I'll show you a map in a minute, at least 30 brothels in Eureka. We've got all these ladies working. Maybe they're still working off the volcano theory and they're necessary in some way, forming a public service. Um, so the city's like, they're here. We could charge them with running a house or being an inmate of a house, but then they violate this law and the county gets the money. Or if we charge them with selling intoxicating liquor without a license, they violate the city ordinance and the city gets the money. So that's what we're gonna do. And they did for years. Literally it got to where a police officer would go around to the brothels the day before and say, okay, it's time to line up. Tomorrow's the day. The ladies would go to the police court, line up, pay, they would be charged. They would pay their bail, 30 bucks. By the end, it was 50 bucks each. Um, and then they'd forfeit their bail and they'd go off for six months. The city would, generated probably more revenue from this than anything else. It helped to make them a solvent local government. They also had to pay traders licenses. So even though they didn't tax them, um, they, and they, these are all lists of the city of Eureka still has all this stuff. It's fascinating to go through with the addresses, with the names and a lot of the names show up over the years. So the city of Eureka also did that too. This is the map I was talking about. I don't actually know the source of this map, but I, got, I mean the original source, but I got it from the Clark. There were over 30 brothels and you could see the little squigglies here right if they're still in the district so this is before 1913 when they closed the district out because brothels 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 so it's busy um and the city of eureka didn't necessarily have the population for that but sailors were coming in and out all the time right it was a busy port and they had what i have been told was called the whiskey train and i know trains would come in on the weekends they bring the workers in on the weekends from the lumber camps and the lumber mills drop them all off in the old town so that I think is how all these different houses stayed in business. But the proper people of Eureka didn't necessarily love this. And by 1908, um, especially city officials were talking about how we had to do something. So initially they restricted the district. In 1908, uh, the mayor and the, the police chief in Eureka said, okay, this is your area ladies, don't go beyond it. And they were literally arrested when they did when they went beyond that district that I showed you. Um, this is Annie. And then there was a woman named Maisie Elmore who was arrested for being outside the district. She was fined $50, which was the equivalent of over $1,500 today, just for walking outside of the district. So this of course was frustrating, we cut into business when ladies felt like they couldn't move around. Um, and Eureka was not the only place that this happened, but there were madams that got together in Eureka and had a ship built on what was then called Gunther Island. We know it as Indian Island or Tolawad. And um, this one is from Santa Cruz. So I don't have a picture of the local boat, but they built a boat. Um, the shipbuilder swore he had no idea what that boat was gonna be used for. <laughs> but if you've been along the waterfront, you know that sound travels, right? So even though they were over on the island, the sounds the revelry, or geez, I think it said, Women of the half world and their male consorts secure from the vigilance of the police. The place has become the scene of wildest orgies. So of course, this is really giving people a hard time. People of Eureka didn't want it. So they sent it to Arcata. <laughs> Arcata went, oh, heck no, we don't want it. And so they actually, the, some of the women, and I still don't have the names of the women that were involved, but they purchased property in the fields landing. The people of Fields Landing heard about it. They had a town meeting and went, oh, hell no, they're not coming here, excuse my language. And they literally put a guard because they were going to uh, land the boat and just move it across the rail and, and put it on the, and basically turn a boat into a building. They were stopped, so it never happened and the boat went away. So, but this um, really, more conversation. We don't need this district, things are bad. Um, Mamie Wright was actually an African-American madam who came here in 1905-1906 um she came into the spotlight a lot i don't have time to talk about her a ton today but when she 1900 the census just to give you some idea frankly 
I'm going to choose a badass. I mean, if you can get over the moral implications of the, the industry that she was in for her to come in in 1900, there were over 25,000 white people. There were, of course, Native Americans, 12 African Americans. And yet she came in and she stayed. She stayed in for at least 15 to 20 years. And she had experience in this industry, but she was also a very good lightning rod for people uh, for, for a moment. And this, this is interesting. So 1909, there, you know, people are still talking about how we need to do something about the district. There was a private attorney that filed a loss, a complaint and targeted Mamie, saying she was running a house of prostitution. Mamie and all the girls were arrested. They're in jail. Um, they end up being released and, and let out. But it turned out everybody's like, Frost is taking this on, right? He's going to be the moral reformer. You know, it turns out Frost had been hired by one of Mamie's former inmates. That former inmate owed Mamie money and was holding the trunk. This girl's trunk is collateral. So Frost had Mamie arrested and the house cleared out so he could go in there and get his client's trunk. Nothing to do with moral reform. But kind of actually Frost ended up working for Mamie later. So absolutely nothing to do with morality. Um, in April of 1912, uh, people are talking even more or again, because this would happen periodically, right? Clearing out the district, clearing out the district. Um, African-American madams in particular were mentioned they had doubled the rents, particularly on those uh, resort owners. Um, let's see, possibly 300 women. It gives you some idea of the number of working women that Eureka had. Um, in November, unfortunately, one of the clients, uh, a customer of Mamie's house, um, had developed a, more than an infatuation with one of her girls and tried to kill her. Fortunately, the girl survived. The guy died. But again, that put the focus on Mamie's house, even though the city said, no, no, it's not Mamie. She's just the first one. You know, we want her out, but we want everybody out. And they started talking about closing the district. And they worked very hard with the mayor and others. They even hired a private attorney. And they were focused on this area, the area I just told you about where the district was, that lower fourth district, 1912. But this time they decided to go after the property owners. They hired an attorney who wrote a letter saying, you got to close this district down. You just, you got to close it down. You got to get those people out of there. And it eventually worked. Um, and they closed it down and scattered the women. One of the ironies of that is the property owners then in the district went, well, we can't rent our houses you need to lower the assessed value because we shouldn't owe the same property tax. And they didn't. And so the city ended up losing money for, in a lot of different ways by closing down this particular district. And they owned when they did that. They weren't getting rid of prostitution. They were simply getting rid of the district. And so what they did is scatter the women throughout Eureka. The other communities, uh, there were other communities that had brothels, of course, but Eureka was still the friendliest one and the busiest. So women scattered throughout Old Town, maybe the African-American madam that I told you about, she ended up in the Pioneer Hotel, which is on First Street. This is <clears throat> just off the corner of First and F. So uh, the Bayview restaurants, you know, kind of across from there, if you can picture that. There it is there. Uh, that's a parking lot where Mamie's house used to be. Um, of course, this didn't get rid of the brothels. Like I said, it just moved them around. So by 1915, 1916, uh, they were looking at the abatement act. So other cities had started doing this and Eureka went, okay, this is what we should do to get rid of these guys. Right. And again, it's targeting the property owners. And basically if they were convicted of rent of renting to somebody uh, who was using their property as a brothel, it would be closed down for a year. They couldn't use that property for anything for a year. So the owners really were facing something if they didn't shut it down. Um, by June of 1916, things were really ramping up. And by June 19th, Eureka's like, okay, we're done. We got them all. Everything's closed. We did it. Of course, they hadn't. In October of 1917, um, a man named Fred Weaver. Um, so this is the Weaver building. It's the Waterfront Cafe. They're in Old Town at First and F. Fred Weaver and his wife operated a number of brothels. Um, they also had a laundry, um, which I believe was where they recruited the girls. And when Fred was arrested, he said, I don't care. I'm not closing down. I don't. He, and he was kind of a rogue, a renegade. He just didn't give a crap. Um, and he ended up being fined like $500 or something, but him and his wife just kept doing it. 
Of course, his wife showed up again in 1925 when they tried again to shut down these houses. And of course, it was just a cycle and it just kept happening. Um, I, some of you guys might be trying to look at the names of the addresses. I do have this information. So at some point, if you want to get in touch with me, let me know. Um, a, a lot of family names you'd recognize, was that? Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm almost there. That is one of the ladies that ran up. Um, so, of course, life continued. I was actually talking to somebody today about Foster Avenue out in Freshwater. Um, this is Clark Foster. This is Amanda Foster. And they in, well, let's see, let's go back here. In, um, in the 1929-1930s, these two broke poor Ruby out of a detention home to put her in a brothel. And I'm guessing it was a brothel that Mandy was running. Um, they were arrested uh, and, and fined. I don't know that they even spent any time in jail. But in 1940, Clark was still at it, trafficking women. You know, so, so Eureka tried, Eureka tried in different ways, but of course it didn't make a difference. Um, and because I've only got five minutes, I will say super quickly, um, dubious distinctions. So in the early 1900s, this woman in San Francisco convinced a girl to come up here and work in a house. Um, the girl said that she had been told it was a theater, but then she told the operator of the house that she was 18. So whether or not the girl knew what she was doing um, is up to question, but she was the first woman convicted in the States of procuring uh, a woman for purposes of prostitution. And then these guys convinced two orphans, basically young women uh, working in Eureka to come with them up to Portland, promised to marry them, ruined them as the saying goes. Um, one, another woman got jealous of the guy on the left there and reported them. And these guys um, became the first in the country convicted under the Mann Act, which um, focused on human trafficking and, and taking women across state lines. So with that, and I went quickly through that, um, I will say before I close and open to questions that even though I made light of part of this, this is an absolutely horrendous life for women, absolutely. But unfortunately there were not, I mean, and there's still a disparity in wages and that sort of thing, but back then, um, if women took a job, they were assumed, a lot assumed it was for pin money. Um, or, and this is where a lot of prostitutes ended up in the work, is they would get a job, but the boss wanted something in exchange for that paycheck. And so a lot of women were like, if I've got to do this anyway, why not see if I can keep more of the money? So there's a lot of ways that women got into the district. That's a deeper, longer conversation. This was kind of high level, just giving you an idea of some of the history. And with that, I will open it up to questions. We've probably got two or three minutes. Yeah. So a longtime Eureka resident who's since passed away used to tell me stories of when he was a boy about a small cookhouse that women would be, you know, kind of hanging out like that picture you were showing from the top. So is that is that a place? Absolutely. Yeah, there were there were a number, you know, and there were there were designated houses like even the upstairs of the small cookhouse, but then there were independent women too who would take rooms in hotels or boarding houses. I mean, so they were everywhere. Oh, like they are now, quite frankly, it's just less obvious. And the building that's the Oberon? Yeah, uh, that I'm sure it's on one of the lists. Yeah, I, I would guess most of the buildings in Old Town at one point or another over the last hundred years have been used for that particular purpose. Any other questions? Uh, tell us more about publication of your book. Oh, well, so, so I became fascinated uh, not only with the industry, but mainly in particular because they kept targeting her, the city kept targeting her, and she just kept going. I mean, and she, a single black woman in the early 1900s, there were no other options. And that particular business, especially if you could run a house, I mean, you had independence, you had money, um, you had autonomy that women did not have otherwise. And so really I focused on her, but then it, it had to be the context as well. So I'm writing historic fiction, but I'm also working on a book about her. So I've, I've got a number of things that I'm working on. Can you touch when those things are? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And you've written lots of other stuff. Yeah. Oh, wow. What's that? I do. I do have a blog. It's totally random. Um, it's it started actually when I was researching the settlement period. So early, if you go back years, um, it's all about a Native American woman who was murdered in Arcata here in 1862. Um, and uh, from the descriptions, her killers literally walked down the street right here and crossed there. Um, it became very real to me that in particular, and that's another one. 
uh, at some point, it's on my list. Um, yeah, but there's, I mean, it's just random local history. It's old building stuff. It's just a million different things. So if you're interested, or you could literally just Google when that's NorCal history, or even if it's just historic photos of Humboldt County, it'll come up because it's been up for years. So. Any other questions? Okay, I want to thank you very much for your time today. Okay.